As I uh, talk, please feel free just to quietly sit and meditate. Uh, close your eyes if you wish. Today everybody is sitting on chairs, so this will be a sitting on chair meditation. <laughs> Some of you may be familiar with sitting uh, like this, cross-legged on the floor. Ajahn Chah emphasized over and over again in his teachings that the important thing is uh, the quality of your mind that you bring to the activity um, and that meditation can take place in it or occur in any posture, standing, walking, sitting or or lying down or on a chair or on the floor the important thing is the quality of your mind as you sit so if you're in a chair like this uh, just try to find a comfortable posture where you can feel at ease in yourself so that you can sit for a reasonable length of time without having to move or worrying about moving. Um, this session is time for about 40 minutes so that's the amount of time you want to be able to just sit quietly listening to these words, the instructions <clears throat> and also practicing meditation and during this session there will be some periods just where it's quiet where I don't talk and so you want to be just comfortable enough to, to, to sit quietly and observe your body and mind as it is in the present moment. And this is the heart of meditation or the purpose of the meditation is uh, giving you the means or a tool to understand truth, uh, to understand the, the truth about yourself as a human being and to understand the truth about this world, the world around us through your own experience. Uh, <clears throat> Ajahn Chah would say often about how we often only have a very superficial understanding of the Buddhist teachings. We may go to temples and perform rituals and ceremonies. We may even listen to Dhamma talks or read books, gather information. But all of this, you might say, is external to the practice. <coughs> it's an important part of the practice, but even more important and where the practice really begins is through developing an awareness or an understanding of ourselves. We have to do that through developing this quality of um, inner reflection, learning to uh, look at ourselves, get to know ourselves better. Uh, there's a teaching that comes from the part of Thailand Ajahn Chah used to live in. Uh, they say, get to know yourself, or get to see yourself as you truly are. Tell yourself what you need to know. Live your life skillfully, and this will bring you to understand the truth. So if we're going to get to know ourselves or see ourselves as we truly are, we have to develop the kind of qualities that meditation is developing. The ability to calm the mind down, settle the mind, and then the ability to look and observe, to, obs to see the true nature of our experience as human beings.
So in fact the first part of meditation is, is the preparation, actually bringing yourself, say on an occasion like this, to sit here. Uh, <coughs> it may seem an obvious fact, but if you weren't here, you wouldn't be here to meditate. Uh, your mind wouldn't be in a state ready to meditate. How do you prepare your mind for meditation? Well, you have to prepare yourself, your body and your mind, uh, composing your body and mind, quietening them down, stilling them. So coming into a quiet place like this, uh, we have the Buddha statue behind me as an example. Uh, we have Sangha members here also as an example. Coming into a quiet place, you quieten your body down, you compose your body. Uh, and you compose your speech. So ideally you don't speak at all during a period of meditation. You can uh, set aside mobile phones and other things. So you compose your body, compose your mind, compose your speech. Just center your attention on the present moment, right here, right now, at this place, at this time. And the way to maintain that sense of composure and peace with your mind in the present moment you have to use an object, something to focus your awareness on. So Ajahn Chah would teach to use the mantra Bhutto, which means the awakened one, or the awakened mind, the enlightened mind. Or the feeling, the sensation of the in and out breath. These can be practiced together or if one finds to just rest, recite Bhutto as a mantra and not follow the breath, one can do that. Or if you find following the sensation of the in and out breath comfortable, convenient for you, you can do that and you don't have to recite Bhutto. Or you, you can do them together. And this is something you might experiment with for yourself. The important thing is to, <clears throat> having taken up an object given to you by a teacher that you trust, that you have some confidence in, then to really start to use that meditation object as a way to focus and train your mind to bring up this quality of inner awareness where you're knowing your own mind, your own body as it is from moment to moment during the course of the meditation. But Ajahn Chah also encouraged us to use wisdom, use some understanding as we meditate, to get the attitude right, and to give ourselves the right instructions, and to, be t to tell ourselves what we need to hear as we meditate. So as you're all here sitting down now, you know, your body is here, but maybe your mind is going to wander away as soon as I stop speaking and instruct you to watch your in and out breath, follow that feeling. You'll probably find straight away your mind goes away somewhere else. You start thinking about uh, other business, you know, what's going on at home, work, your life other people, other places, and so on. So you also have to give yourself the right instructions as you meditate. And that might be very simple. You just quietly tell yourself, not now. Don't think about what I'm going to have for dinner tonight now. This is not the time. And don't think about work, what I'm going to do tomorrow or next day now. This is not the right time. You remind yourself what you're doing. And this quality, bringing your mind to the present moment and explaining to yourself what you're doing. Uh, the technical term in Buddhism 
Buddhism we call this sati and sampajanya. Sati means presence of mind, uh, recollecting oneself in the present moment. Sampajanya means a clear understanding of what you're doing. And you can see we need these two qualities in everything we do in life. To do anything well, you need mindfulness and clear comprehension of what you're doing. But we also lose our mindfulness and we lose our understanding very easily because our mind is not yet trained. So Ajahn Chah gave a very simple technique how to develop these qualities, whether it's in meditation or any, any time in our daily life. So mindfulness is just having that ability to stop and ask yourself the question, what am I doing right now? Sampajanya, the clear comprehension, the clear understanding is the answer. Oh, I am focusing my mind on the breath going in and out. Uh, or I'm driving a car, or I'm walking down a corridor, whatever you're doing, the answer is the clear understanding, I'm doing this right now. So if you're meditating here, directing your mind to follow the sensation of the in and out breath, that's your clear comprehension, isn't it? I'm bringing my attention to the present moment, focusing my mind on the breath. <clears throat> That's having sati and sampajanya present at this very moment. If during the course of the meditation you start thinking, when I get home tonight, I want to have dinner with my friend and then do this, do that, you've lost sati and you've lost sampajanya. You've lost the direction of your mind, the purpose of what you're doing right now, that's gone. So during the course of any meditation session, your aim is always to bring or direct the mind back to its object. So the sensation of the breath, you're getting to know what it feels like as the breath goes in and the breath goes out, concentrating maybe at the tip of your nostrils, finding that feeling. And any time during the meditation your mind wanders away, it's distracted. Or if you find you're falling asleep, whatever. As soon as you realize you've lost your awareness of the breath, that's the time to redirect your attention back to the object. That's what we say is having mindfulness and clear comprehension. So it's a training, it's a practice. Sometimes we have it, sometimes we don't. Uh, but it's occasions like this, when you come together to meditate, you see other people are doing it, that gives you some motivation, some energy to do it yourself. And you have to be very, very patient. <coughs> Nothing comes easily in life, whatever you think about, that you want to do or, or get in this world, you need patience to achieve it. And meditation is the same. So Ajahn Chah said, as you meditate, you develop this quality of mindfulness, clear comprehension, guarding over your mind, watching over your mind, just as parents look after a young child who maybe has just learned to walk and they're starting to walk or run around everywhere there's the potential for much danger so the parents always have to keep their mind keep one eye on the child to know where is the child what's it getting up to to protect it your mind is the same as you meditate that part of the mind that 
that is mindfulness and clear comprehension is like mum and dad then the mind itself with all its different moods, emotions, sensations arising, passing away and this is like the child and you have to keep watching over it directing its attention back to itself to the breath so you have to have great patience you have to develop a good attitude take care with your mind uh, not give up but if you keep doing it then little by little you'll find your mind does start to settle down it becomes a little easier to direct your mind to the in and out breath and the whole experience starts to bring a sense of goodness uh, wellness to the mind and the body as you meditate at first it can be a little bit frustrating but if you keep practicing and maybe practice regularly the mind starts to understand what it has to do because you're teaching it in the right way and our mind, our human mind can be taught otherwise you would not have got to where you are today in your life in your families, in your work, what you've achieved so far that's all proven to you that you can train this mind so meditation is the same you're learning to train the mind giving it the right instructions and after a while it'll start to get get the point and settle down what you find then as your mind starts to settle down during meditation is that you experience some inner peace inner calm the body starts to relax as you let go of your concerns about itches and pains and different sensations your mind starts to relax as you let go about all the thoughts about the future about the past and you just bring your awareness to center on the breath as it is in the present moment breathing in breathing out and because your mind is right there that it appreciates the breath all the more so the breath becomes something very stable very satisfying to the mind as an idea it sounds very boring watching the breath go in breath go out sounds very boring and if you tell your friends that's how you spend your time they'll probably laugh at you but uh, all our teachers from the Buddha down to Ajahn Chah and to the current Sangha can confirm that it's not a waste of time it's something that will bring you great inner happiness and it gives you the tools the means to gradually purify your mind and free it from all stress all suffering and if perfected this practice will bring you all the way to the completely pure mind the mind of uh, enlightenment the mind of Bhutto but that's up to us to practice to train the mind but you'll find if you do practice regularly the sense of inner calm peace will grow the sense of um, being more patient more happy in yourself will grow your only emotional states happiness sadness anger worry all of these emotional states will start to be a little bit less troubling to you you have less stress less suffering in your life uh, the Buddha Ajahn Chah they've guaranteed this but we have to do the practice so we have a little bit of time now 
I've been talking a lot, so I'll keep quiet <coughs> for the last part of this session. Just try meditating on the feeling of the in and out breath. Find it at the tip of your nostrils. Try and hold your attention there. Keep bringing the mind back to the breath. If you find it helpful, you can count. Uh, one breath in, one. Breathe out, one. Breathe in, two. Breathe out, two. Just count up until 10 and then go back to one again. It's another way you can, again, hold your attention in the present moment. Just try and see if you can find the feeling of the breath. Hold your attention with that. Remind yourself to let go of everything else. It doesn't matter at this time. Just bring your mind to focus on the breath until you hear uh, my voice again and it will be time to stop. So we can just do that quietly together. And hopefully you'll find it beneficial.
one final part of the meditation. Been meditating for about 10 minutes, 15 minutes now. Just before we finish, it's a good opportunity to, we say, spread the wholesome dhammas, the happiness that we've been generating in our own minds at this time, spread it outwards to others. Uh, share the merits of our practice at this time with our parents, family members, relatives, friends, and all sentient beings. So just maybe we can dedicate the last few minutes of the meditation. Whatever wholesome dhammas, skillful dhammas have arisen during this period of meditation for me. May others also experience some of this same happiness and well-being and consciously spread the feeling of peace or calm that you've been developing outwards in all directions to family, friends and all sentient beings. Just consciously do that for a few minutes at the end of this meditation. So you can uh, <clears throat> quietly open your eyes and we'll bring the, uh, this meditation session to an end. Uh, but I think I'm programmed to speak a little bit more on the Dhamma, so I can maybe explain a little bit more in the following talk. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato samma samputasa 
นะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะนะโมทัสสะภะคะวะโตอะระหะโตสัมมาสัมพุทธัสสะพุทธังธรรมังสังขังนามสามิHe seemed to um, embody the teachings, which gave many people great hope and happiness that the Buddha's teachings are still alive today and have been carried on. You know, the Buddha was alive 2,500 years ago, so sometimes that sounds like a long time ago, and it's very easy to get lost in the feeling maybe it's not relevant anymore. You know, the nice philosophy to believe in some good ideas, but maybe not relevant. <coughs> but it's our good fortune that teachers like Ajahn Chah have existed in the world to show us that the teachings are still relevant and. Human beings still can practice the way of the Dhamma in this current era, and even if we didn't meet Lumpur c h a o personally, we can still benefit from his teachings through the books and through the living sangha of his students that are still here, uh, reminding us that this teaching is relevant and it really is the way that leads out of suffering. And I don't think anybody in this world likes suffering. 
But what Ajahn Chah pointed out was that if you want to really experience the end of suffering and the happiness of that, then we have to practice. We have to give up to the practice, we have to learn how to practice and then put it into, into practice in our daily lives. Uh, there's a famous saying the Buddha gave, Jitang uh, Dantang Sukhawahang a well-trained mind brings happiness. And my understanding of Ajahn Chah is that he's a teacher who encouraged people to train for themselves. And he always pointed out that a teacher can lead by example, and he was a very good example. They can encourage, they can give uh, skillful means for us as students to, to, to practice, but they can't do it for us. We have to do the practice for ourselves through our own efforts. And that's our great good fortune that teachers like Ajahn Chah have been in existence to give us that encouragement and give us skillful means and reflections and give us the roadmap for how to practice for the end of suffering. And we're lucky, very, very lucky, very fortunate that with these examples, teachers such as Ajahn Chah and Sangha, the roadmap to the end of suffering is here for us to follow. Uh, we have the Sangha to lead us when we have doubts or confusion in the practice we, we can uh, turn to the Sangha as those who are experienced in the practice uh, to point out where we are on the road map, maybe where we're lost or getting stuck or straying from the path. The important point is there is a road map, there is a way to follow, a way to practice, and that's our good fortune. It's something that perhaps we could say we're celebrating today uh, the fact that we do have a living tradition, uh, a living teaching that can help us in our daily lives to sort out some of the confusion, some of the stress that we inevitably meet living in this world as human beings. So Ajahn Chah was always pointing to the Dhamma and encouraging us to look to the Dhamma, to understand Dhamma, meaning understand truth. Uh, the truth of this body, this mind, the truth about life as we lead it, and to particularly to understand well, where does suffering come from? Where does stress come from? How can we deal with it? And the Buddha's teachings are very clear here. They cover everything. Uh, the Buddha's teachings give us a very clear uh, way to understand the mind and how to free it from suffering. You know, the Buddha didn't make it very complicated for us. He said, you only really need to know and understand four things and most of us can count to four, so <laughs> four things. Uh, suffering, get to know what suffering is, understand suffering and its stress and its nature. Get to understand its cause and having understood, known what the cause of suffering is, well, abandon that, give it up. Experience the end of suffering, the cessation of suffering, for oneself in one's own mind and then to know what the path that leads to the end of suffering is and to follow it. So to know suffering, its cause, the end of suffering and the path that leads to the end of the suffering. Only four things. And this is what we're practicing as Buddhists. This is what we're learning about and looking at in our daily lives. And Ajahn Chah, very, very skillful. If you read his books, it's constantly giving us different uh, methods and strategies and reflections on how to do this, where to look, and to look at your own mind. You know, suffering, the suffering that you can remedy, it arises in your own mind, in your own thinking, in your own experience. Obviously there's a lot of suffering in this world that there's not much we can do about. So it's not like Buddhism gives you some teaching that sort of is a miraculous cure for everything and will solve every bit of suffering in this world. But the suffering we can cure 
is in our own minds, isn't it? Our own wrong thinking that comes up, takes over the mind, leads to craving and attachment, greed, anger, delusion, and leads to the experience of stress in daily life. This is what we can do something about. And just as we were practicing meditation a few minutes ago, you know, when you learn to develop some inner awareness, the ability to look back at your own mind, you can see where suffering arises, can't you? And you can also see where it ends. And you see, suffering arises and ends in the same place. It may be simply just grasping onto some thought, some mood that's come up in your life through some experience and just recognizing that by turning your awareness back on yourself, looking at your own mind more closely, you might see, oh, I'm doing this to myself. <laughs> you know, maybe just some feeling of tension from your physical condition. We have health issues and the aging of this body. Maybe something external, what's going on in our life, in our family life, our work, the pressures of these things living in the world. But where we actually experience suffering and the end of suffering is in our own mind, isn't it? It's in our own consciousness. So that's where we've got to look and that's where we've got to learn uh, what to do to remove the causes of stress from the mind. How do we do that? Often we don't actually have to go anywhere or do very much. We simply take that time to, to stop and pay more attention to what's going on in our life to what we're thinking, what we're saying, what we're doing from moment to moment through our day. So Ajahn Chah would always be encouraging to develop this quality of uh, mindful awareness and a clear understanding, learning how to reflect wisely on what we're doing, to look more deeply at what we're doing and see what leads to what. You know, if suffering, if we do feel we're experiencing some suffering, some unhappiness, or well, where does it come from? There must be a cause somewhere. These things don't just pop into our minds and our life at random. There's causes, aren't there? And often just the very lack of awareness in, in itself is the main cause. Or sometimes it's just some wrong view, some wrong thinking we've been caught into that's come up and we haven't seen. So learning to look back and investigate more deeply uh, is very much at the heart of the practice. So how do we do that? Well, we have to learn how to facilitate that, how to develop the right skills to be able to see our own minds better and know and, and understand our own minds better. So the basic training that Ajahn Chah encouraged, just like any uh, wise Buddhist teachers for, since the time of the Buddha, is a very practical and uh, easy to understand pathway for developing the, the qualities to look after this mind and free it from suffering. So always beginning with, you know, just develop a sense of basic sense of generosity and awareness, sensitivity of other people living in this world as well as oneself and understand the relationship between oneself and others in this world. Because as we're born into this world as human beings, we tend to have a basic delusion that we're always caught up with our own business, our own body and mind, our own aspirations and ambitions, our own thoughts and desires. Uh, but often we don't see how we're relating to the world around us. So the very heart of Buddhist practice always begins with generosity and appreciation that we're not here alone uh, we couldn't be, could we? Because we've got parents. Mm -hmm. Nobody comes into this world on their own. We have parents who give, give us birth, look after us, teach us, bring us up, give us language. If we didn't have language, we wouldn't even be able to hear the Dhamma. So our parents have given us much and our teachers and many other people have helped us. So the beginning of Dhamma practice is just recognizing that, isn't it? Just realizing, oh, I'm not here alone. There are other people that I depend on that have helped me. 
and then the next step is, well, what can I do give back to them? What can I do to support the world, not only for their benefit, but also for my own benefit? You know, if you practice any form of dana, generosity, where you're actually thinking of others as well as yourself, the effect on the mind is it brings oneself a lot of joy, a lot of peace, a lot of happiness and good memories. And obviously we do benefit that which is beneficial for others around us. And this is the very heart and the beginning of the Buddhist path. Just recognizing that fact that we're not here alone in this world and that other people matter as well as us and our relations with other people matter as well. So Ajahn Chah very good at encouraging that, uh, encouraging us to not only see that but to practice that, you know, to practice dana, to give something back to those that have given to us, uh, to take care with the world around us, our environment, meaning other people in society and the environment around us, to take, take care of it and not to get too caught up in our own selfish desires all the time, but, always, but also to see the importance that when we look after other people and the world around us, we're also looking after ourselves. You, you, you are nourishing your own mind with very wholesome dhammas, very skillful states of mind when you take an interest in others and the world around us. So they go hand in hand. The way Ajahn Chah would talk about this, we call it the Brahma Vihara Dhammas, uh, the dwelling place of Brahma. Uh, Brahma means those divine beings in heavenly abodes with sense of uh, unconditional kindness, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity. And these four qualities that the Buddha and teachers like Ajahn Chah encompass uh, and very good examples of that. These are, these are qualities to, to develop in our daily life. You know, the basic attitudes of kindness, compassion, caring for oneself, caring for others, seeing the importance of both, uh, not to be careless or not to neglect the fact that we've been born into this world with a human body and all that it brings with it, a human body, a human mind. You know, this is our great good fortune and not to be heedless with that, with that birth, but to actually make use of our, our human birth in the best 